what I referred to earlier, spiritual hunger, a real hunger. That hunger is slowly affecting more and more people in this modern age. We have plenty to satisfy physical hunger, plenty for intellectual hunger. In spite of all this, a nameless hunger is coming to humanity today. We call it spiritual because it is not genetically limited. It takes us beyond this genetic limitation. The spiritual is infinite. The genetic is limited here. But the real spiritual nature of man is infinite. It is one with all. In spiritual life, I am one with you, one with everybody. One infinite spiritual energy functioning through you and through the universe. That knowledge we are seeking today, science is pointing in that direction. Many scientists... Infinite, it is one with all. In spiritual life, I am one with you, one with everybody. One infinite spiritual energy functioning through you and through the universe. That knowledge we are seeking today, science is pointing in that direction. Many scientists are explicitly stating this truth. For example, man like Schrodinger, nuclear scientist, he says the profoundest truth about man is this tattvamasi, you are that. You are that. Suppose I am depressed, I am weak, the doctor will come. Why are you depressed? That's not your true dimension. You are healthy and strong. Try to manifest your true nature. There's a language we use. So in all human weaknesses, we neglect one factor that is within, the source of infinite strength. That is the Atman, the divine, hidden in all beings. And today, there is a real search in this direction. Many other seekings we have done. The greatest search today is the search for the divine. So spiritual life looms large in human life today. What is that thing called spiritual life? What is this technique? How can we achieve it? Even scientists are eager to know this. After all, they may be great scientists in dealing with the world outside. But in this field, they are babies. They are children. This profound mystery makes us feel we are like children before the world. This has been given expression too by a great English poet, Tennyson. I like his lines wonderfully. Before the mystery of the unknown in man and nature, what is man's reaction? And he answers, but what am I, an infant, crying in the night, an infant crying for the light, and with no language but a cry. A baby has nothing but a cry. We are babies in the spiritual world. We want to grow, we want to unfold, we want to mature. That is called the spiritual life. That is on in the modern age. That is the most beautiful aspect of modern technological civilization. It is satisfaction with what is achieved around, a seeking for something higher, deeper. This is expressed by the great Shankara Acharya, the profoundest philosopher of India of the 8th century AD, in a famous hymn. That hymn ends with a question. Every verse ends with a question. It's a wonderful language. Tatakkim, 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 tatakkim. What next? What next? What else? What else? You have health, you have beauty, you have power. Still the heart will ask you, what next? What else? That question will come. You have got all the achievements of life, great position and other enjoyments. Still the heart will ask this question, what else? What else? Until you get this answer, this is my true nature. Tattvamasi, I must experience for myself. Then only all this questioning will go. I'll be established in my own true nature, in my true own true dimension. That is the spiritual quest, which alone can lead to fulfillment. All values are spiritual. Even eating physical food, Vedanta sees as something spiritual. You are developing your body, 
you are evolving in a particular direction. So, from that point of view, everything is spiritual. It's a spiritual pilgrimage man is engaged in. No animal can have a spiritual pilgrimage, nor even a psychic pilgrimage. Its pilgrimage is encoded in its genetic system, and it only follows whatever the genetic code tells it. Man alone can go beyond the genetic code, beyond the genetic kind of dictation. He can be free. He can be free. And freedom is a spiritual value. You should always remember, freedom, even political freedom, is a spiritual value functioning at a particular level. Physical freedom is also a spiritual value functioning at that physical level. Somebody compresses my body, keeps it under bondage, I want to break through from it. What is that experience? It is a spiritual experience. All freedom is spiritual experience, but it doesn't end up merely with physical freedom, even intellectual freedom, or political freedom, or freedom from hunger. These are all freedoms, but the supreme freedom is the freedom of the spirit. I have realized my infinite nature. I am free, I am free, I am free. You can proclaim you are free. One of the poems of Vivekananda is this great song of freedom. What a beautiful idea. I am free. In Hindi, in Urdu, they call it Azad. Repeat day and, day and night, I am free, I am free, Vivekananda said. That freedom is a spiritual value. How many people are physically free, economically free, politically free, but spiritually unfree? Today we find plenty of people. In fact, there was an article in the American Journal, most probably Reader's Digest, about 20 years ago. He says, we think we are all free. Actually, we are not. In a highly technical civilization, you are not free. Everything is made for you. An advertisement says, this toothpaste is best. And you are immediately carried away by that advertisement. You go and purchase it. Are you free? Not at all. Somebody is manipulating you all the time. In a highly technical civilization, freedom is in your party. Everything is manipulated for you. The Swami was telling me today that certain footsteps like bread, you must take only what is regulated by the government, the enriched food. You can't take anything else, you can't sell also. You are not free, everything is given to you. So where is freedom? Freedom is a wonderful value, we all want to seek it, but there is more of regulation of my life by external forces than even we have in any kind of society. So it is a spiritual value. We can be unfree in a free political system. We can be free even in an unfree political system. I saw in India, when India was unfree under the British, there were more free people. A man like Gandhi was a free-minded person, though politically he was not free. In free India, there are so many unfree people, petty-minded, small, but there is freedom there. So this wonderful idea of freedom is a spiritual value. We must realize that spiritual freedom, that will come only not by having more food, more clothing, more gadgets, not at all. Realizing our true nature, I am free, I am free. Shuddha, Buddha, Mukta Subhava, Paramatman. That's my true nature, Shankaracharya said. Ever pure, ever free, ever illumined self, that is my true nature. I must realize it. It's not a matter for belief. In Christian teaching, if a teacher tells you, Jesus died on the cross. You just believe he came for you, then everything is okay. Vedanta will never say so. By simply believing that somebody did something for you, you can't be free. In very many verses, Shankara explains it. If you are hungry, father and mother cannot eat on your behalf, you have to eat yourself. If you are carrying a heavy burden, somebody can help you. But in hunger, you must eat for yourself. In matter of truth, you have to experience it yourself.